teenage girls, just like teenage boys, are individual human beings and can be attracted to a utopia. The narrative that you are following the instructions of the Prophet Muhammad, you're doing what Allah has told you, engaging in jihad is honorable, and you'll be rewarded in heaven, that narrative is attractive to both young men and young women. I think some girls lack confidence and want to be part of some, you know, a powerful movement, but some girls are actually overconfident. If you look at the three teenagers from the UK, they were three straight A students, very popular, very confident, and um, they, they found themselves persuaded that to go and join ISIS was probably the most honorable thing that they could do. To think that somebody could be enticed to journey thousands of miles away to a country they have never been to for some promise online of some kind of glory, what is it that they're being offered and why are they so susceptible to it? I mean, I, I don't know about you, I am, but I can kind of understand a boy's desire to fight. Mm -hmm. What's happening to these girls mystifies me. Well, I tried to think back to my own life. When I was 15 years old, 16 years old, when the teacher preachers, you know, the radical preachers came into my neighborhood and into my school, I remember feeling drawn to it. And I, I don't want that. That's why I'm not judging them all too harshly because if the whole ISIS deal was there at the age of 15, I could be one of those girls who actually went there. And you have to feel terribly sorry for them. For I feel terribly sorry for them, but I think the most important thing is for us to understand what is the background. And I, I am I'm not going to... I have to choose my words very carefully because the parents are devastated. But um, these, these girls... Uh, grow up in a social environment that cocoons them, that walls them off from the rest of society. And the narrative of life after death, the narrative of, you know, this absolute right and wrong, the narrative of you have to do what the Prophet told you to do, that is already there. And you don't just go online and get radicalized. There is something, bef you know, the whole idea of submission, you should only obey your parents, mm -hmm. don't question the prophet. That's already in place. And by the time you're 15, 16, and you're working it through, if you run into someone, they ran into people online, I ran into my teacher at school. I mean, where else are you more protected than at school with your own teachers? And, and that's when you, you know, that gets strengthened and strengthened. And at that age, you not only want to understand the difference between right and wrong, but very often, strong characters want to do something about it. I have to say that in my career, I've never felt held back because I'm a woman. Claire, my co-author, has a very interesting story about how when she was on political panels um, this week with George Stephanopoulos, for example, she would notice that she spoke less than the men on the panel. And she thought, this is really weird. I'm sure I'm speaking less. And so she went back over the tapes and found that, sure enough, she was speaking 30% less on average <clears throat> than the men on the panel. But what she realized was that nobody was cutting her off. She was self-censoring. In her desire to have all of her answers concise and tight and original and perfect, she was actually speaking less than all of the men on the panel. And... In some ways, maybe women do that in journalism. Maybe they do it in professions, you know, not just in journalism, in other industries as well. I have, I've never, I mean, sure, I'm on political panels where I'm the only woman routinely. Routinely. It happens all the time. It happens for women in almost every industry. One day that won't be the case, I hope. Um, what can the industry be better? As in all industries, be more conscious of this and be conscious, too, of the fact that half our audiences are women.